Hello and welcome to um, the fifth installment of our series on how local governments can support community composting. And we're very pleased today to uh, offer this one, the fifth installment, as I said, on food scrap drop-off partnerships with local government. This one focused on uh, Western New York. Uh, this is, um, uh, today I'm joined by my uh, colleague, Megan Matthews, who may pop in with her video to say hello before she turns turns off her video cam. So she's in the background helping today. Thank you, Megan. Um, and uh, I just want, we, Megan is gonna share in the chat a link to the first four webinars in the series. You can, they're all recorded, you can check them out. The first one was a spotlight on New York City. Um, the second one was on uh, featuring food scrap collectors and composters with municipal contracts. And the third was on cities and counties with public-private partnerships with community composting operators. The fourth one we held last October was kind of a menu of options. We had zoning in San Diego, we had grant programs in rural areas in Vermont, and other examples. So do check those out. Again, Megan's putting the link in the chat for you. Uh, today's presenters, um, we have uh, going to help me moderate and do an introduction is Sashti uh, Balasundaram. Welcome, Sashti. He's a social entrepreneur, innovator, and educator. He founded We Radiate LLC, which is an ag tech company that develops smart sensors that digi digitally track data uh, variables such as compost temperature as well as humidity. And this technology makes it easier for operators to ensure high quality standards. He has vast knowledge in community composting. He was a teacher at the New York City Master Composter Program. He co-founded a community garden in Brooklyn that was doing community composting, which is where I first met um, or where I first met you. And he's worked at the Lower East Side Ecology Center in New York City, which has been doing community composting for many years. He also had a stint in the mayor's office in the city of Buffalo as their recycling representative. Also joined with him today are three speakers from three different governments in Western um, New York. Uh, Sashji's gonna introduce them later, so I won't repeat that. So let me, um, but before we get into that, um, let me just share with you a little bit about the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and our Composting for Community initiative. We have a national forum every year, except for we did take a break during COVID, but we have workshops, we do webinars like this, we have po a podcast, we have a coalition. If you're a member of the Community Composter Coalition, we do invite local governments with active community composting programs to join. We would love to have you. Uh, we have a Google group. If you're a member of the coalition, we have guides, we do policy resources, we do composting workshops for the small scale. We have some videos. So check out some of those resources. I wanted to share in addition to this series on local government, uh, webinars. We have a whole library of webinars that are all recorded on all aspects of composting at the local level, from how to avoid rodents to um, uh, policy to if you're a, a new startup and looking at um, what kind of business structure you want. We have one on entity structure for community composting and many others. So do check those out. We have an online course that we designed to kind of fill the gap between home composting training and commercial operator training. So if you're interested in community composting at kind of the school size or smaller on-farm composting or community garden urban farming, this course may be a perfect course for you. We have bulk discounts and scholarships available. Um, you'll get a copy of the slide deck, but there's the link. And I don't know, Megan, if you have that hand, you could put that link in the chat too. There's a QR code. Uh, so check that out. It's about three and a half hours total, seven modules, self-paced. You get a certificate at the end, knowledge checks, if you pass all the knowledge checks, that is. So why community composting? One of the beauties of composting, a lot of you have heard me say this already, is that it can be small scale, like a worm bin in a classroom, a backyard bin in your backyard, 
or large scale industrial and literally everything in between. There's no one way to collect the food scraps and the other organics and there's no one way to compost. And what we're interested at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is really promoting a diverse infrastructure that's healthy, that's locally based. We define community composting as basically you're making and using compost within the same community in which that material is generated. And so, you know, of course we want to reduce food scraps, we want to rescue food that can be eaten, promote home composting, but before we get to large scale composting and industrial or mixed waste, and certainly before landfilling and burning, there's this small scale decentralized and medium scale locally based that we could be promoting that often gets overlooked. So this is one of the reasons why we've kind of launched um, our program and as well as this webinar series. So before we get started on our presenters, and this kind of has allowed us to get people into the room, thank you for joining. We have more than 100 of you, but we wanted to give a sense of who is participating today. So Megan will run the poll. So what best describes your affiliation? And just select the best option. Are you a community composter? Are you a food scrap collection service provider? I know you could be in more than one bucket. Are you a local government, state or federal government, or other? And we like to try to see if we can get close to 75 or 80 percent of you participating, which we are there. So let's just show the results, Megan. All right, local government, 50%, you are showing up today. Community composters, 20% of you. Uh, food scrap collection providers, state and federal government and other. Everybody is welcome, thank you for joining today. All right, so let's get started. So at this point, um, I am going to, um, oh, gonna share one more thing with you, sorry. And then we'll get into our presentation. So. Uh, we've been doing surveys over the last few years with community composters who are operating at the local level and identifying what their top priorities are and or, and or this particular question that we asked was what kind of public and or private sector assistance would be most useful to your operation. I know for some of you it's hard to read these but I'll just point out the top one at this for this particular survey was policies to encourage composting long-term access to land. Land is one of the top challenges we consistently hear about. Um, and grants, startup funding, another big one, and supplies equipment. But um, policies to encourage composting can also include contracts. So don't forget if you're a local government that you have a lot of power to support community composting at many different levels. So you know, if you don't have a lot of money, that's understood, but there are probably other things you could be doing to support keeping composting local. So at this point, I'm gonna hand the mic to Sashti to introduce um, the speakers today and set the stage for this, the local governments he's been working with in Western New York. Welcome, Sashti. Thank you, Brenda, uh, and pleasure to connect with most of you. Um, uh, virtually. Um, good afternoon and good morning wherever you may be all across the country. I know we have people from New York State and also from California and everywhere in between and internationally. So um, this will speak about sort of case studies and particular examples that I have connected with um, at the location in western New York. It's called Erie County. And um, actually Megan, if you, cool, you're there. Um, and what I, what I pitched to Brenda and the team was how can we discuss these themes of community composting and uh, support with elected officials, both at an urban, suburban, and actually at a county level, rural locations. And we're hoping to discuss all those three different sectors and locations. So uh, Brenda mentioned I was a community composter. I also worked in government as well, so I have that experience. And now I, I am an entrepreneur, so I have my own business. Um, and quickly talk about that business quickly. It's a, it's called We Radiate. Um, Megan, if you go to the previous screen, please. Um, our aim is to improve soil health. We do that through technology. So we are manufacturing smart sensors in the US, in New York State, to improve regulatory compliance, to ensure uh, pathogen breakdown. Um, so we're 
essentially doing remote monitoring of temperature is one aspect, but we do a lot of advisory, we do a lot of advocacy work as well. And that's where we'll discuss a lot of these themes of me being in the field, me making these connections, but how that can encapsulate over several years. years. Um, so that's some of the work that we do as well. For those that do not know what, where Erie County is located, here's a, here's a map of New York State. And the, the orange is, is sort of considered Western New York, has a population of about 1 million residents, um, size is about 1,000 square miles. Um, besides, what is it known for? Besides the sports teams here, uh, football and hockey professional teams, uh, it actually has uh, University of Buffalo, which is, I believe, the largest student population in New York State out of the SUNY systems. And um, really great architecture. So if you're ever interested in sort of urban design, uh, how the parks were created, it's Olmstead Park is here. I think that's the individual who also did um, Central Park and, and Brooklyn Park as well. Um, and Frank Lloyd Wright has the Darwin Martin House here as well. So uh, very close to Niagara Falls, but um, not quite considered in Niagara Falls. That's in Niagara County. Um, thanks, Megan. Next slide. And um, so Gary, uh, this is in reverse order of individuals speaking. So Gary uh, will be sort of talking about at the county level, his role uh, in terms of composting and also creating an organics management plan. <laughs> That's Gary. Um, next slide. And John is uh, a really engaged citizen. And this is uh, in the town of Amherst. So the town of Amherst is about 100 30,000 in the last census. It is home to SUNY North Campus, SUNY Buffalo North Campus. And for those who uh, have to commute to work, it's about a 20 minute mean uh, commute ride, average total time to get to work. And um, median household is about 80,000. Uh, and lastly is sort of Danielle and speaking on her uh, focus with the city of Buffalo. Um, and City of Buffalo, quick statistics on that, it's about 300,000 or 275,000. Um, foreign born population is about 10%, and persons in, living in poverty is 25%. So it's um, case studies can be varied between the town of Amherst, which has a poverty rate of under 10%, to the City of Buffalo. So how do you structure programs? How do you do outreach? How do you do engagement on, on these different uh, locations that are still in one county? Um, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, Danielle. I've known her as a colleague and friend for several years now. Um, she is now moved towards working in the Office of Health Equity at, at Erie County, but her discussion will be on um, her role uh, when I met her with an, a community-based organization called the Massachusetts Avenue Project. And her um, and our connection and collaboration when I was at the city of Buffalo to begin a local food scrap drop-off program. Um, Danielle has a wealth of knowledge, and hopefully she can explain some of that in her health equity during this uh, the next couple of slides as well. So I hand it off to her. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Um, so as Sashti mentioned, I'm here to talk about my time with the Massachusetts Avenue Project. Um, and the community food scrap collection program that we launched um, in 2018. Um, it's important to know just a little bit about Massachusetts Avenue Project, or we call it MAP. Um, they're a nonprofit urban farm and youth development organization. So um, I ran their mobile market program. So I was taking fruits and vegetables out in an adorable cartoon decorated vehicle across the city of Buffalo to areas with limited access to fresh foods. and um, we piloted this project at our farm stand, um, but just to give an idea of what the community li was like um, before the food scrap collection, it was um, very diverse, um, people that are very poised to eat fresh food, so like a, a community prime to participate in this type of program. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So in 2018, we piloted the project with the city of Buffalo. They approached us um, with this pilot program. Um, I thank Sashi for his relentlessness because as I mentioned, I was out in a vehicle all the time, so I'm hard to nail down. Um, but uh, it was you know, really simple bare bones to this, to this program. So 
uh, the city of Buffalo agreed to provide a person, you know, they had uh, Sashti on staff, but then they also had an AmeriCorps uh, member there too. Um, and they would provide the education, you know, his skill set is in this realm. Um, and the tote pickup coordination. So they had the vendor secured. It was a local composting facility. Um, and that was, you know, their end of the bargain. And then on our end, we were asked to provide a secure and welcoming location, um, a person dedicated to managing the program, um, do all the outreach piece. So for us, that looks like um, in a community that's, um, we're located on the west side of Buffalo, which is predominantly an immigrant community. So we're looking at, uh, uh people not readily connected to the internet not necessarily speaking english so we had to get a bit creative with our outreach but that was already kind of our wheelhouse right because we're um selling fresh food already um so we were doing a lot of door-to-door -door, uh passing out information and talking with folks when we could and then also storing the tote and um the scale to uh, monitor the program and that first year um really short eight-week program we were able to collect 1500 pounds of food scraps um, I think that, you know, I was pretty impressed with our ability to um, just kick it off and get right in there. But I think in a lot of ways, that's largely due to our style of community development. So um, I ran the mobile market program and yes, we sold fruits and vegetables, but really we were a community development program. So we were, you know, fruits and vegetables were like the thing in between the people, um, the common ground that we could talk about, but we were really cultivating relationships. So. Um, adding this um, extra piece onto what we were already doing felt really natural. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So it was really important to me that um, this program meet people where they're at. We had, um, you know, people that were interested in the food system and accessing fresh foods, but they weren't necessarily aware of composting or generally interested in it. Um, we live in a city that loves urban agriculture, and it was really um, growing at that time in 2018, and community gardening was already a pretty big thing in Buffalo. So there's definitely opportunities there, but there wasn't a whole lot of action around composting overall. Um, so we tried to do our best to meet people where they're at. We had really simple instructions. Yes, you can bring this. No, you cannot bring that. And then we also made sure that we are really prepared, and I was grateful for the city um, for even thinking of this. So we had our, our uh, coat for the food scraps, of course, um, but then we also had um, bins for recyclable materials and then uh, just landfill materials too. So when people came up, if you know they're um, bringing things that were gonna contaminate the food scrap collection, we were well prepared to accept everything so that we weren't sending people um, back to their uh, homes with their scraps, because nothing's more gross than that, I suppose. Um, yeah, so this, you know, we are really well prepared. So you can go to the next slide, please. We also, um, by our organizational culture, we're just leaders by example. So um, it wouldn't have been easy for us to talk about a program that we weren't participating in ourselves. So you can see in this picture, um, the person with the green t-shirt um, bringing their food scraps you know, they were um, super into juicing and uh, vegan and just very and energetic about vegetables overall. So it was a natural fit that um, Chevy pictured here would be kind of the leader of making sure they had their food scraps every single week. And we all participated um, on different scales. So, you know, I was usually the person with like the reused Ziploc baggie full of stuff. And then, you know, Chevy had the whole bucket. Um, and then there were people that, you know, had their really nice compost buckets that they kept on their kitchen counter and people that just had like old Tupperwares and stuff. So uh, we just made sure that the community could see us participating in the program. Um, and that includes us making mistakes and um, learning, you know, that like banana stickers couldn't go in the bin and things like that. And so making sure that those actions were visible by the community. Um, and then on the city's end, offering information was a huge piece of this program. Um, it's always engaging to have um, pamphlets and materials to take away, which is great. Um, but also, um, we you know weren't shy about having a worm bin on site, and Sashi will just put a handful of soil in a kid's hands and um, really change the mindsets about um, what healthy soil really looks like and you know what decomposing food is like, you know, and made it um approachable which is really great 
Um, we focused on plain language, so connecting to the community through images. You know, we can't fall back on English all the time in the neighborhood that we're in. So we used a lot of imagery and we did tons of documentation for social and then for future grant proposals. Um, we, you know, plain language is actually a really important piece too because Buffalo has a really low literacy rate. So we wanted to make sure that everybody understood what we were trying to do without having um, too much difficulty. Uh, next slide. Um, as you can imagine, contamination is a concern starting out a program like this. Um, and we tried to utilize social to combat that and get people um, on the same page. So we used a little game called What Do You See quite often. Um, and this uh, was throughout the entirety of the program. So having people engage conversation uh, about what they see in the bin. So in these pictures, you see food scraps, you see those compostable bags. Um, that we didn't initially take, and then we wound up um, actually handing them out to folks and utilizing them. But in this picture, you also see a paper bag. And while we all know paper isn't really a huge problem um, in many of uh, food scrap collection bins, it's what's inside that we don't know. So we had to talk to people about, um, you know, dumping your bags out and having uh, a garbage bin on hand just in case people had trash that they accumulated. Um, to have that conversation about contamination and what was the most efficient container to bring your food scraps in and things like that. Next slide. So um, in the subsequent years, the Massachusetts Avenue Project was able to maintain uh, the location at their farm. Um, and then we were able to add another location. So as I mentioned, we were a mobile market. So we were able to engage one of the communities that we visited to also start food scrap collection. Um, and we kept um, doing the outreach work. We also picked up the tote pickup coordination um, and storing the tote. We did wind up moving from taking uh, more accurate weight measures to doing a bit of estimating, which um, definitely had its drawbacks, but it still provided us a decent, well-rounded um, number to uh, rely on what our scrap collection was like. And we more than doubled in the second year um, we did move to two totes on site. So we had um, two bins of food scraps and then we also were able to eliminate the uh, recycling bin and trash bin. People were just like, they were just really doing it. They were super into it. Um, and the city of Buffalo was able to um, provide a staff person as needed. So we didn't need the education piece so much anymore because all of our staff had been trained and the materials were readily available. Um, and then we would bring in somebody to do demos and provide additional information as um, as needed. And you know, one of the big things that came out of the second year, like what we learned was that we were offering a ton of transferable skills to the community that were dropping off food scraps. And the people are just kind of asking questions like, what is this big orange bin? Um, we heard a lot of people saying, hey, I started composting at home for my garden or you really motivated me to you know, reduce the food waste and think about um, the way I'm cooking my food. And then one of the big ones, um, as the city took a step back and the focus was more on our wheelhouse, which MAP was like more into like cooking and growing food, um, was we taught like everybody how to make vegetable broth. I don't know like if this is something other groups have found has like a, a unintended good consequence or something. I don't know what the right word is, but. Um, so many people are telling us that they were making veggie scrap broth. So they were reducing their waste, but they were also reducing the amount that went into the food scrap collection, which is like, you know, as they engage their neighbors in doing it, I guess we probably won in uh, the numbers game, but um, it was just really fun to hear that people are making food scrap broth. Um, next slide. So this is what the schedule looked like to the community. The city of Buffalo provided all the marketing pieces um, so you can see here we had seasonal locations with the access limited. So this enabled us to control for contamination um, and to have consistent flow of people. So they could rely on us to be there. The bins were there. Um, it was unfortunately also weather dependent. We noticed on days when the weather wasn't great, you know, our farm stand business would reduce, um, but also the scrap collection would reduce. Um, the location labeled Buffalo Promise Neighborhood, that was the other mobile market location. Um, thinking long term, we uh, wanted to maintain the neighborhood ownership of that location. So we didn't put our brand on it. We were just merely there um, providing the education piece and, and monitoring the totes. Um, and we saw 
a decent like a maintained increase over time but um which i think is remarkable considering that the number of locations continued to expand so they were able to expand the program to other locations um across the city so in, in the beginning when we saw people coming all the way from north buffalo to the west side of buffalo now we're seeing people more localized but we were able to maintain our numbers of participants and um the pounds that we collected um, as everyone knows, COVID happened in 2020, and um, while most places were closed, we were open, so people got um, really chatty <laughs> at the food scrap collection, so I think we gained a lot of new people because we had new people coming to the farm stands and mobile markets um, that were seeking us out because we were open and because we had fresh food, um, so then they were happy to participate in this extra service that we provided. And that's when we kind of low key just um, decided that we were leaving the bins out 24 hours a day. Um, we did agree with the city that we would do our best to maintain it for contamination and, you know, keep looking in the bins and keeping track. And we put a lot of signs up and stuff like that. Um, but I think that's really a big reason why we were able to maintain our um, the pounds that year was because people had access to it, whether they were coming to the market or not. Um, and then in 21 and 2022, we saw a more gradual increase of pickups. Uh, again, they were able to expand the sites. So if you could go to the next slide, um, we were able to fortify that 24 hour access piece um, with the city, um, maintaining that you know the, the bins would be monitored and we would put them out for collection. Um, and then we continued to have like some education on our site. It kind of evolved more to like classes. Um, uh, with in partnership with the community gardening organization in Buffalo. Um, but yeah, so we were able to grow. So now they have the seasonal sites and they have the permanent sites. Um, we did have to plan for a lot of hiccups. Um, there we had to, you know, there were days where all of a sudden we would come and the, the bins would be like overflowing and we didn't, we had no way to plan for that. So we had to have like an extra container on hand. So that was something that came up that we, we um, were surprised by. Um, and then also one of the bigger hiccups that we, I don't know, they're probably still dealing with this. I'm not there anymore, but um, smaller restaurants would find out about this and then just come and um, bring their food scraps, which like, I'm super proud of them, but also it's just really meant to be for residential folks. So it was hard to, um, to say no to that, you know, to uh, encourage a different solution. But um, we did always have on hand information from a local service provider, the, they're called the Farmer Pirates, um, which I think is a great name for what they do. And they do residential and restaurant uh, compost pickup. So um, I think that that was a decent solution to have that information and to have them um, consistently available to take on new clients. Um, next slide. And then lastly, um, you know, this isn't my accomplishment, but I do feel as though the uh, organization and our work to engage people um, around food scrap collection in general, waste reduction, sustainability measures overall. Um, the city of Buffalo did announce last year that they will be piloting a residential food scrap pickup and they had an RFP. And I do know that um, they have awarded that uh, contract to a residential pickup um, that will pilot in some neighborhoods over the city of Buffalo. So I feel I can take a little bit of the credit for that. I feel really proud of the work that we did um, together with the city to get people engaged and just bring in their food scraps. So thank you. That is all I have. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, yeah. so that, that residential pickup pilot um, is a one-year program with a potential extension to another second year, and that is from a community compost organization called Farmer Pirates. Yep. Uh, they're located right on the east side of Buffalo. Um, so essentially an idea from the city of Buffalo with a really strong community partner called Massachusetts Avenue Project in five years time. Now the city is piloting a residential pickup with a, a local community uh, composting organization. So it takes a little bit of time and uh, hopefully the pandemic accelerated growth in this space, but um, it can happen for sure uh, with a place like Buffalo with uh, low literacy and a lot of foreign born uh, individuals. Um, thanks, Danielle, and feel free to ask questions. We have a, we're trying to have a Q and A afterwards, um, so we'll do all three panelists, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So, 
feel free to write them over the next couple of moments and then we're transitioning to um, to John. Um, John will be speaking on the town of Amherst and the town of Amherst is uh, a location just north of the city, um, has about 130,000 individuals, mostly suburban um, and a little bit more affluent, uh, but there is still a, a number of uh, individuals who are born overseas. So John uh, now chairs the Recycling and Waste uh, Committee, Advisory Committee uh, within the town of Amherst. That's how I connected with him. When I connected with him, he was just a member. So now he's the chair. Uh, kudos to John. And then he has been very diligent over the last several years to work as a, as a great citizen um, to work with these elected officials on recycling for organics, but also does a lot of other environmental initiatives for plastic recycling as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, so this is uh, the town of Amherst. So take it away, John. And you're just on mute. Fingers crossed, John. Okay, there you go. I think I hear you. Great. I'm gonna get off. Okay. I keep I keep hitting the hitting the mute button and come keep keeps popping back. Anyway, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. John. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, with my with that introduction, I'm gonna skip over the slide number two here. Um, and I have this one up. Just to remind everyone that composting is is only what happens to our organic matter, but it's we do it in a controlled environment. It's the same thing that we do out out, out, in, out in the natural environment. If you kicked into the leaves on this floor floor, you'd find a layer of crumbly brown decayed material. It's pretty much the same thing as what what the rot is there. It's pretty much the same thing you do as when when you're composting. And if your elected officials don't think that your town is ready to do organics recycling, consider the fact that you're probably already doing it to some degree. If your community picks up brush, leaves, glass, grass clippings, etc., and you're probably probably doing some type of composting of that either municipally or through or through a third party. Um, if not, you really should be because yard trimmings, as you can see here, are about a twelfth of your total waste collections by weight. Now, every branch or glass, uh, grass clipping bag kept out of your trash collection avoids additional landfill costs. Now, as you see on here, food is almost three times as much of the, of the total as your yard, uh, your yard waste. And that is why the town of Amherst started to think that maybe this was a good idea and they gave the volunteers the approval to start our drop-off program for food scraps. Um, you know, you probably already all know that, you know, it obviously re reduces the landfill costs. It's going to create a nutrient-rich compost, which is an excellent soil amendment. Um, obviously, uh, it, you know, the way instead of having a rot in the landfill, creating methane, you're taking that out of the equation. You're combating global warming. So, you know, if you have the town of Amherst had a number of environmentally friendly um, uh, leaders at the time and were, were able to, you know, we were able to get this started. Now, the program started in 2019. Um, is a weekly supervised drop-off site at the Williamsville Farmers Market, which is right outside our, outside of our town hall. Now, just like uh, Danielle mentioned earlier, we got food scraps in pretty much every way, shape, or form. It came in Tupperware, it came in bags, it came in totes. You know, what whatever whatever you know people could bring in. Um, in 2021, the town got a grant from the state to purchase the kitchen counter collectors that, that you can see uh, on the right-hand side, uh, as well as 
more dedicated um, totes for the uh, food scrap collections. Um, now we are giving those totes out free to all town residents who request one. And um, the site that we have at the market in Williamsville, you can see a volunteer just behind the collections bin uh, with, with a blue mask at the time. Um, one of the benefits that those volunteers uh, bring to the bring to the equation is we get to interact with the residents, can answer questions on both our recycling as well as our composting program, and we are handing those bins out directly to you know to residents at, at the markets or and you know any other you know um, community events that we, that we're that we're going through. Now. The market runs only through the end of October. And we were getting near the end of the season and people were asking what we were going to do that first year once the market was over. And we convinced the town to take the next step, to have a permanent drop-off site, which is now located at the, at, at the highway department, which is nor, uh, north of of our, you know, in north in northern Amherst, um, they they still wanted to have some, you know, some um, monitoring of, of the drop-offs, which is why you know it wouldn't be you know some other location they they could keep an eye on what was going on because you know they they were still worried about contamination from you know things like plastic bags and they just wanted to make sure that you know they could see what was going on. And um, for the first two years, our collections were going to a local community uh, composting company, uh, River Road Research in, in South Buffalo. Basically, the only cost that the town had at that point was to move the bins from the collection sites to the, to the River Road Research facility. Uh, that has changed over the over the past couple of years. In 2021, the town um, started a on-site composting um, facility, and right now we are still we're you know we're still in the infancy stages of getting that started, but we're getting a lot of input from uh, local uh, comp uh, local composting uh, companies. Yeah, as to how to best maintain, you know, our operations, you know, get the get the pile, you know, heated up and things like that. Now, knowing that we were starting small, uh, just like uh, the uh, the people in Buffalo, you know, the the list of acceptable and non acceptable items is pretty much the same. Um, you know, when you're doing these types of things, meat, bone, dairy, things like that, if if your pile doesn't get hot enough, you want to make sure it has to, you know, it, it won't kill all of the pathogens that could possibly be included in things like that. And also, you know, it, it's more likely to draw uh, draw animals to the site, which need, you know, the town was, you know, they, they don't want to encourage that. One of the issues that we dealt with, you know, before we con uh, con convinced the town to get this going was to make, you know, that it would not be, you know, an attraction to things like rats and, you know, other wild, wild critters out there. Now, these are the totals just from the drop-off sites uh, at, at the farmer's market. And 2020. 2019 was a pretty good year, consider, you know, considering we started out, you know, with word of mouth, and it built up month after month. 2020 was lousy weather at the beginning, and then COVID, and so 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021 are kind of like eh, tough to tough to tell if we're making any any steps forward. Last year, however, our numbers just you know just skyrocketed. Um, people are really getting involved with the, with the composting initiative, and in 2022, the people were coming back to the market as well. So that's why we, 
that's why we had such such a huge increase at that point. Um, what we're looking at in the future here, I mean, our last, the last thing that we added to the program, we had a pumpkin drop off last year that, as you can see on, on the right side, that, that truck was pretty, pretty loaded. Um, nobody really knew what we were going to get. Again, this was a word of mouth kind of thing. There was no advertising that went on and that truck was pretty full. Um, we're now in the uh, process of looking for more drop-off sites. Um, probably at still at uh, facilities that the town operates. Uh, we're not quite at the point yet where you know we would we would be working with uh, you know private private businesses and things like that. Um, the things that we, you know, things that we are looking at, and you know, just to make sure that we're ahead of the game. Um, New York State in 2022 started a large-scale organics recycling pro uh, program for, you know, for, you know, universities and and the like, where you where you have uh, or large manufacturing operations um, like uh, uh, food, food food vendors and things like that, um, where they would either have to donate or, or or recycle um eventually those regulations as the landfills you know continue to fill up are going to start you know start you know getting smaller and smaller so you know we have to we're watching to make sure that um that these uh, laws you know we're ready for any any changes that might impact us uh including something as simple as uh uh, curbside pickups. Uh, might, there's preliminary talk, you know, as to what neighborhoods might be amenable to the curb, you know, for a test for pickups. Uh, but we're not at that point yet. You know, and, and, you know, just to recap here, you know, our, our our experience with municipal food scrap composting, it's volunteer driven, and we're still doing a lot of a lot of uh, outreach and education to move the program forward. This isn't really the only model that that would work for for any community. Um, I mean, even smaller communities can start up a program. If it, even if you're rural, for instance, if you have if you have a drop off site for compo uh, for recyclables and waste, you can start a food scrap collection by just adding just adding bins for for that and you know keeping a monitor on that partnering up with a local composter. Uh, so, you know, there are, you know, there are other models. This is just one. Um, I hope that um, you get, you got some information out of this. Um, my email is on the screen there. If you have any questions as, you know, as to what we're doing in Amherst, um, I'd be more than happy to, you know, answer any questions you would have. Okay. And I'll pass this back to Sashti. Thank you, John. Um, so in summary, it's essentially a way how John um, discussed this over the past couple of years. This was a, a volunteer citizen run uh, event and initiative, and we had to showcase uh, how to do this correctly uh, with the town officials, with elected officials. Um, as they saw the data, saw, they saw the photographs, as they saw the results, um, they were very keen to continue and now expand the program. So it's been sort of a citizen-run grassroots initiative. Um, and now sort of focusing on the other aspect, uh, Gary, um, is the, uh, the Erie County's solid waste recycling specialist. So he will be discussing it at a sort of a different level. Uh, Gary sits within Erie County's Environment and Planning Department. Uh, and Gary is also the president of the New York State Association for Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling. So we're very lucky to have Gary and his, um, his presence here in Western New York and Buffalo to serve uh, Erie County, but um, definitely has key colleagues and contacts all across the state of New York. So I'll let, I'll, uh, and, the, and Gary is our, our final uh, speaker. So after Gary, we will have time for questions. Hey, thanks a lot, Sashi. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, yes. excellent. Okay, Good to go. Uh, so.
so uh, thanks thanks to Sashti and for the Institute for Social Self-Reliance, Local Self-Reliance for uh, putting this on and for inviting me. Uh, I did want to note that the town of Amherst ran its own yard waste composting facility for a, a good number of years. Um, and then I think about 10 years ago, they ended up uh, sell it, selling it and privatizing it. Uh, so Amherst has always been a leader uh, in, uh, you know, in management of, of waste and even, you know, for years, uh, they pick up yard waste. They don't allow plastic or anything, plastic bags or anything. You put it in open containers. So, um, we have a lot of great communities in Erie County that take a lead. So I just want to talk just very briefly about um, Erie County, the Department of Environment and Planning, what, what we do. Um, we work with all the municipalities. There are 38 municipalities in Erie County. Um, we provide uh, hazardous waste collection opportunities, uh, do a lot of outreach and education on all of these issues. And um, to be noted that Erie County is set up where each individual municipality handles its own waste. So we don't have a centralized pickup. The county itself is not, um, is not running a landfill or anything like that. We are, you know, we truly provide uh, assistance and education to the municipal. Uh, and uh, we, we've we always talked about composting, as, as I'll get into a little bit more, but uh, it's really so encouraging to see more and more municipalities to get interested. And as Sashti mentioned, uh, I am also president of NISAR, the New York State Association for Reduction, Reuse, Recycling. We have a very vibrant organics committee uh, that meets uh, every month uh, you know, virtually, you know, so we have people from all over the state. And uh, they just put on, uh, with, uh, along with the Department of Environmental Conservation, a tremendous uh, organic summit, which was just a couple of weeks ago uh, in Syracuse. And uh, the most attendees we've ever had, and this was the ninth annual summit, uh, and exciting to hear and see so many people engaged uh, in these issues. So, all right, so what's happening with uh, compost in Erie County? Uh, I, I would be, you know, I must note that uh, it's the state solid waste management plan that puts so much focus on, on properly handling your recycling uh, that allows us as, as a municipality, as a county to, to really focus on this stuff. This slide I have up is actually the current solid waste management plan beyond waste right now the state has just put out their draft for the next 10-year plan and it has uh, even more focus on organics um, i know um, john mentioned the um, the recent law that went into place for larger facilities i think it's if you generate uh, two tons a week that that's the requirement to either donate or compost your way, your food scraps. Uh, if if there is a facility within 25 miles, that's the current law. The new uh, the new plan does promote um, uh, making some changes, reducing that number, um, and um, uh, also uh, the increasing the the opportunities the the businesses that do it so i just want to mention that that we wouldn't do it without new york state uh ah sorry I forget that was my that was my big uh my big uh, excitement there so erie county for years what we always promoted composting um about about 20 years ago we started with the earth machine and and this is this is my big this is my big action here. Truckload sale. I hope everyone liked that. Um, uh, there, this actually at that time, the state provided funding uh, for municipalities to give away backyard composters, uh, and then over time, the the funding went down. But people people came. We we had these truckload sales for years, and every year we'd get five hundred, a thousand people. And then we also we promoted composting at you know area events in schools, 
Uh, this was a brochure on building your own composter. We always let people know you don't have to buy a composter. There's lots of easy ways, including your own pile. And then this is a great book that the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, always had available. We've always had that at different events. I think John, as a matter of fact, I think I gave it to uh, uh, the town of Amherst to have with some, at some of your events because it's got a lot of great tips. And as you know, I mean, composting really doesn't change, especially backyard composting. So then the next step and and how we uh, Erie County became more involved in in organics management and actually uh, building an, a compost site was uh, we became very involved in the climate smart communities and that is was very much with the support of our county executive and we Erie County became a climate smart community uh, and we also have always taken advantage of the municipal waste and recycling grants from uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, we could not do what we do uh, in the community without the grants that New York State provides. So that was a big, uh, a big part of what we're able to do. And out of our climate smart communities, we created a green team uh, that uh, allowed all our departments, all our elected officials, you know, like the, um, the like the sheriff's office, the comptroller's office. We all met monthly and began to work on initiatives internally. And it was actually from a green team meeting that our sheriff's department rep mentioned that there's there's land at the correctional facility that could potentially hold a compost site and soon after that uh, a grant came out in this case it was a climate smart communities grant to build a compost site so you know in government sometimes you're sort of in your own silo and you don't necessarily know what's going on in other places because of the green team we really broke those we really broke down those silos and so we went ahead and we wrote a grant to build a, a compost site at our uh, correctional facility in Alden it's a rural community and uh, we we got the grant and we got the grant and we began to to work on the on the program and there's the you know, on the left is is what we started with and on the right is you know what we ended up with now um and it is it is a uh we do it in the in the piles uh and we use a front end loader to mix the materials we are at the all the correctional facility we are um composting all all food scraps so, and that includes the meat and, and again as john mentioned it all depends on the type of composting you do uh, so we're, we do it in such a way that the temperatures are high enough to take care of all that. And interestingly, I'll just, uh, as an aside, note that um, because this is such a rural location and it's, you know, it's on prison property, so we, we do not have to worry about neighbors. There is some uh, wild animals that, that visit the compost pile that has really not proven to be a problem. Um, but, and I think uh, our compost operator there notes that the, the coyotes particularly don't like oranges because a lot of times in the morning they'll find a circle of oranges around the compost pile. So that's uh, just just a, a note of interest that, it, you know, unless you're out there doing it, you probably wouldn't know. Unfortunately, uh, we also were massively impacted by COVID at this compost facility. A big piece of the design was that we would utilize the inmates uh, as a training opportunity for them to learn about composting and working a composting site and also collecting. They're all, they were collecting not only the kitchen scraps, but also a post-consumer. So each, each of the, they call them pods, uh, they each had like a a captain that would monitor the food, you know, the scraping of the food so they could get the right materials. And that was all going really great for a few months and then COVID hit and it it just slowed everything down to a crawl uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, uh, much, much less staffing availability and therefore they couldn't have as many inmates working. They had to eliminate the, the uh, post-consumer collection program because again they just didn't have enough so they switched they were doing just the the kitchen scraps so that that severely slowed us down and we have just just the beginning of this year so for a couple of months we we're just beginning 
uh, to regain and put the program back to where uh, where it was at. Um, that's uh, that's what we're, so we are seeing, you know, some light here. Um, as a matter of fact, just in the past month, we have now added, we're now picking up also um, uh, pre-consumer uh, kitchen scraps from our holding center. So we have a holding center in, the, in downtown Buffalo and then the correctional facility in, uh, out in, in a rural uh, municipality in Alden, New York. So, um, and that uh, actually, that was a second grant that we received uh, from the state to begin this collection program, which we had to put on hold because of COVID. And um, so that will start, then soon we'll, we'll also start a limited food uh, collection program in the building that I'm in. It's, a, it's our main government building, the the RAF building where a lot of the government operations are. We're going to begin to start here. So our plan is to start to uh, expand this to other facilities as possible. Uh, um, the, the holding center, uh, uh, not only will are we able to collect all those food, all that, all the food scraps, but um, they were they were having some significant problems. Uh, with uh, varmints getting into the garbage, and that's we're, we're already seeing a huge change of that because we had taken care of that at, at some levels, but now that we have these lockable totes, special totes to collect the food waste, the garbage itself, which is kept in a different spot, is not uh, impacted. So that's sort of a side benefit that uh, that we've seen. Um, the other thing I wanted to notice or mention that we've been doing is talking to school districts about uh, about considering composting in their kitchens and we're really doing this as a, um, a money management uh, topic and I did want to note that in one in a recent presentation I did I used a part of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance uh, uh, graphics that they had about composting so thanks for for giving that but also um, I also presented with a school district that was already doing this. Um, we worked with them last year, uh, uh, got them started, and so I gave sort of an over, you know, general presentation of the the waste management benefits of possibly uh, pulling their all their food scraps out uh, out of their regular garbage and composting it. About the different ways from doing it right at the school, you know, to connecting with a local farmer possibly, or, or again, because New York State has, um, uh, has, is encouraging more composting and anaerobic digestion by having this new law in place, um, more and more companies are popping up uh, that, are, that are doing composting. So again, letting schools know that this stuff is out there. Um, I did get some panic. A couple of schools thought that this was, was going to be, uh, a requirement for schools, and I, as a matter of fact, schools are exempt from currently from the New York State law. Um, but I let them know, and we get, we gave them some some costs that this school that is showing you Springville um, has saved because they're they're not throwing out all this garbage. So that's just another potential option, and and that came actually from again another part of uh, of our government. The comptroller's office was interested, and they had some connection to the Springfield School District. So um, you never know where, where you're going to get these opportunities, you know, working with within your structure or outside, you know, so there's lots of ways to, to get the word out and encourage people. And that's just a, a lot of, the, during her presentation, the kitchen manager's presentation, she noticed that a lot of times they just roast vegetables and, and People love it. Now I know that um, you already saw these these drop offs, but I just did want to note that um, this you know the city of Buffalo, as you heard, you know is, has a dynamic drop off program. As a matter of fact, um, I do drop off my compost at the MAP um, program, which is still going strong. Uh, and they went um, they went from in 2021 to 2022, they doubled the amount of food scraps they're collecting. They went from 30,000 pounds to 60,000 pounds. Um, those are general numbers. But so again, more and more people are hearing about this uh, and and wanting to, to do the right thing. And people are also seeing the benefits uh, of, of pulling, you know, the, 
the food scraps out of their garbage how you know how much less they have to put out the garbage and you know how how the garbage doesn't smell and things like that the city also has um, a yard waste drop-off program where if you bring your yard waste you can also get um, some compost uh, and so again um, the city does compost yard waste at certain times of year but this allows people to uh, you know be in control of this and uh, uh, make sure that their that their yard waste and, and scraps are getting composted uh, and then as far as Erie County goes I wanted to mention and I'm just about ready to wrap up here but um, once again a, a, a DEC grant uh, that we received um, we will be going to our next step here, which is actually somewhat, or actually maybe 100% copying what the town of Amherst is doing. We're, we're working with, with Sashti, with Reradiate, um, and we'll be uh, having five different municipalities and we're uh, over, over a three year period that will begin a similar program. We'll be outreaching for volunteers, uh, the municipality will offer, similar to what John mentioned that Amherst is doing now, uh, for, for um, uh, specific locations, they'll drop off the totes and they'll pick them up. And then we're also asking that they have a permanent drop-off site, for instance, at their highway garage. And at the end, we will then help the, each municipality write an organics management plan. So that's all part of this um, this newest grant, which we haven't quite started yet. I wish I could tell you more about it, but um, we are just getting it. We're just finalizing our plans with uh, with the state to get this program going. So we're excited about that, and uh, we're definitely going to be uh, talking more with John about um, what Amherst has done because they really have have done a tremendous job with this. And as as he noted, I mean, not without not a whole lot of out. I mean, people hear about it. People really want to get involved with this. And that is uh, that is me. Uh, and as John noted, I mean, you're I'm always more than happy to answer any questions. There's my email, my phone number. Uh, our website also has a lot of, uh, of good resources, uh, eerie.gov slash recycling. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to, to share. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um, this is wonderful. Thank you for the three panelists as well. And perfect timing at two o'clock. Um, Brenda wanted to do Q&A or have more time for Q&A. So her wish is granted and we're receiving a number of great questions. So Brenda, I'll, I'll sort of let you take it away. And thank you so much, Gary, as well for that sort of overview of Erie County and then now the Alden Correctional Facility on, on sort of that rural location and now looking to to the future of the organics management plan um, that we're able to develop together for Erie County. Yeah, so let me just add, yes, thank you to, to all four of you. And uh, um, Danielle, if you could turn your video, um, video on too, we'll have you join for the panel. And let me just say, before we start with the questions, keep them coming, guys, is I just love, let me just reflect a little bit on what I heard. I mean, Danielle, I just loved, first of all, I love Scrap It. That's such a great outreach thing. Um, and that, you know, you started, you know, that it's a community development program with transferable skills, building community, probably an easy thing, easy in air quotes, but um, as a way to, and, and, and um, John, you mentioned this too, leading towards curbside collection and wider access for everybody for food scrap collection. But starting at farmer's markets, it's such a great way to begin. And we're seeing that all across the country. It's uh, temporary, it's just on the weekends, but then it leads to more permanent drop-off sites and then to curbside, as we talked about. John is a volunteer. I just want to emphasize that. Not everybody here is actually paid government staff. So John, thank you for your volunteer work. And you emphasize that the drop-off program was citizen-run and volunteer-driven, and, and often that's how these things start. So, um, and Gary, I just loved the connection with the climate smart communities and the green team and the sheriff's department and how that, you know, getting people out of their silos and the importance of the state solid waste 
plan and the state funding and kind of that kind of larger institutional support is is so critical. So I'm going to hand it to Sashti in a minute. He's going to ask some questions, but I we we did have a number of questions just on the composting itself. And Gary, you know, talked about at the correctional facility, but then if Danielle and um, John, you could just briefly mention where the food scraps are going for composting. And if we can all keep our answers short, we'll get to more of your question. So Danielle, can you just say a word about where the compost is actually going in Buffalo? Uh, yeah, um, um, we were working with uh, Buffalo River Compost, which is a local composting facility, but um, we quickly outgrew their, um, pickup capabilities and wound up working with a regional company. Oh my gosh, upcycle, natural, natural upcycling. Yeah, I couldn't think of their name. Um, so staying in, in the region um, and but leaving Buffalo. So the farm itself didn't have access to the composting, but we do our own thing. So that was totally fine with us. And that's actually an uh, anaerobic digester that natural upcycling works with. Well, they work with a few different people, but I think that's the majority. Yeah. Well, part of the story, Daniel, I didn't call out, but it's just that, you know, the interest of the local restaurants and then growing uh, farmer pirates, you know, business and client base, which I did put their link in the in the chat. And John, what where does your food scraps go for composting and what's the yeah, right. Um Originally, we did start out with uh, uh, with the River uh, River Road Research uh, in, in Buffalo, and about a year and a half ago, the town started in, uh, on on one of on one of the town uh, owned sites to start has started their own composting for for the food scraps. So it's you know it's take, taking the food scraps now it's taking a little bit of the uh, some of the yard waste that's being picked up as well. Um, and so it's going, it's being done on site at this point. And that's that's in windrows. So it's sort of in a larger scale, win, not larger scale, but in windrows. So it's not necessarily a three bin system at the moment. Mm -hmm. All right, so Sashti, I'll hand the mic to you to ask some questions. All right, and feel free to also uh, co-facilitate with me, Brenda. But um, I'm gonna go to uh, sort of Danielle um, as the first person here. Um, one of the questions we're just curious, you know, you were working on the ground, um, and there's usually there can be tension working with elected officials or you know regional governments. Just curious on what reservations or concerns you had or the organization had as a community-based organization partnering with a local government, and what actions sort of eased those concerns. Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest pieces that we were most worried about. Um, especially when you're approached by a municipality with something blatantly called a pilot project as continuity, right? So, you know, how um, when we kick off this amazing program and get everybody super invested in it and we become really proud of our work, like what happens when the person leaves their job um, or the leadership changes within government or the priorities of the municipality change? Um, so I think that was something that we were pretty nervous about um, going in, but you know I, I think that uh, given our organization's nature and the relationship we were able to build with the city of Buffalo, um, it really uh, primed us to to have some trust. They, the city really trusted us to like do our thing and take leadership um, and keep the program going. And I, you know because it was successful, it it stayed on. Um, and, you know, at the same time, the um, as the staff people changed through the recycling uh, program, the um, continuity was insured throughout throughout. So like even right now, the um, commit commissioner director um, is retiring and the person in the seat below her has assured the organization, you know, that this program's maintaining this is why and everything. So um, though all those fears were kind of quelled with that type of conversation and that trust that we built. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of shift to John. So Brenda had mentioned John is a volunteer, very engaged, civically uh, engaged individual. Um, so John, based on your experience, 
doing this for a number of years. What are strategies that you can share that have engaged elected officials to support um, organics recycling solutions or community composting um, sort of at that level? A um, couple of things. First, first thing that, that, that's really important is to, to, to really find a champion. I mean, in, in Buffalo, you know, it's by council, so you might have to deal with your council person originally. But in, in Amherst, as well as, you know, many other communities, you know, out there, uh, the, the elected officials are at large. So they, 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 they represent the entire, entire spectrum of, 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 of our community. Usually one or two of them is more inclined to, to follow, follow in your footsteps um, compared, compared to the rest of the group. So if you can find the champion to, that can, you know, work with you on, you know, on, um, you know, getting a program started or, you know, continuing, expanding, that kind of deal, that, that, that's, that's key. Um, if you're just starting out, if you have a model of of another local community that has done this already government is copycat it, 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 at its finest um if they can if they can just take one piece one document cross out the name of the community and put theirs in they are so happy with you you would not believe it uh the other thing volunteer i mean i volunteered on a waste and recycling committee but if you have a cleanup cleanup event that's sponsored by one of the local officials, or if you have, if there's a you know if there's a uh, um, you know a, a community whatever community event that might be, being a volunteer gets you gets you engaged not only with the elected officials but with like like-minded people that can help you help you you know uh, you know build build a, a, a cause that you know that people listen to and. Uh, can you know help you get things across? Thank you, John. Um, Austin, yes, I, of, of course, John. Uh, the 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 Amherst Recycling and Waste Committee really led this, and you know this very well because you, Sashti, you were a part of that. Um, really, the town saw the interest from the volunteers and jumped on board uh so it really that made a huge difference i do not know that the town would have ever embraced this if they hadn't had a group of energized volunteers that were willing to be out there every saturday you know i mean it, that really did make a difference so i agree with you john the champion's important but those volunteers those citizens of that community really let that's that's one of the main reasons i think it has worked so well and i love your example john of actually copycatting so this idea um, came from when i was working in new york city there was actually we created a drop-off in harlem uh, with uh, when i was working with the lower east side ecology center with the new york city compost project so that sort of model i brought to the mayor's office in, in the city of buffalo went well with Matt and Danielle, and then sort of copied that to a suburban farmer's market to the town of Amherst. So I love mm -hmm. that example of copycatting. Um, show what works and present that well. Um, and then also collecting data. Mm -hmm. So just to add on is uh, mm -hmm. I think people or organizations or, or elected officials like to see numbers and they hopefully like to see numbers improving. So having that data, the amount of participation, the amount of drop off material and waiter volume going up um, every year, hopefully, uh, showcases the work uh, and showcases potential continuity of a program. So having that um, marketing material and also data is key. Uh, I will go to Gary. Gary hasn't been asked this question, but sort of uh, now Gary is in sort of, has and has been in government for several, several years. Uh, can you share successful examples of ideas or actions led by community groups in which government has adopted or supported? Uh, well, the town of Amherst is certainly one, but I would I would say the city of Buffalo wasn't always a leader in uh, recycling 
uh, waste reduction outreach and there was a group called the Buffalo Recycling Alliance uh, that worked with the Western Arc Environmental Alliance uh, and, and Erie County was involved with both groups, the Environmental Alliance that worked on a lot of broad issues and then the Buffalo Recycling Alliance and they really pushed the city to hire a recycling coordinator and to engage in this work and it was the power of citizens that did this i you know i i think that the city thought ah we i don't know if we need this and they kept hearing that this group put on events this group you know engaged the city and then the next thing you know they did they re they brought that position into uh, the department of public works and that position grew i mean so you know there there's more like an office of solid waste I can't quite remember the name of it but um so yes uh i think that's the the best example that was probably maybe 10 years ago that that group got together and interestingly they they did they didn't stay together because they'd achieved their goal of you know getting the city to engage in this and uh then you know the individuals went on to other things but uh, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. You know, citizens working on these issues, you know, can can really make results. Now, let me, um, there's a question that came in that may be related to a kind of citizen engagement, which is, do any of these programs have a, have a specific, specifically equity-based focus to ensure the involvement of marginalized neighborhoods? And Danielle, I'm going to start with you since you have equity in your title now. <laughs> so, I don't know, can you, can you give me like a, a lead-in or a little bit more clarification? Well, just, you know, you, you, you're having these at farmer's markets and you're, you know, you have your outreach materials. Is there anything you're doing to ensure that you're, that the folks from marginalized neighborhoods have access to the program? Are the sites yeah. located there? Is the outreach in different languages? I don't know. It could be any number of things. I would think that you're, have an equity-based focus. Yeah, I um sorry, I just I think um because of the work that we were already doing, I think it was um rather natural to us. Um you know, we we were all English speaking at our farm stand and we seem to communicate with residents in the community just fine because we had that like common language of food. Um and you know, it, it, sure it wasn't easy for everybody, but um we definitely were uh, recognized the cultural differences and tried our best to have um, champions and community residents that um, were at some of the sites. So for example, the Buffalo Promise neighborhood, the one location that I mentioned, almost all of the people that were dropping off um, food scraps were from like a little um, uh, cultural enclave around the corner of Bangladeshi community. And they had like this one guy that just explained it and then all these women would bring literally in a wagon their food scraps so um it really took those community champions and then as i mentioned in the presentation like almost all of our flyers are all about images so limited words lots of pictures um which just um you know we're doing it already for social media which is really um when you're working for a small nonprofit like that it's really for your funders the, the social media is not for the community you're serving um, and the the door to door conversations um, that that we definitely struggled through sometimes um, relied heavily on that imagery. So having a lot of signs at the market with a lot of pictures um, was key. But um, I really think the biggest piece to um, ensure equity for our program was having the folks at, that were working the market participating. I can't tell you how big that was for people to like physically see. You know, after a transaction, I'd be like, oh, I got to go grab my bag and go and dump it. And everyone was um, just participating together. So um, really cultivating community in that way. And Gary, was there a component of with the climate um, smart communities that had equity or serve, you know, anything you can add to this? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, so we, we just released our draft climate action plan and it had a uh, six different focus areas and the day day one of when when the group first got together was a whole training on equity and we've worked very hard to get the message out into 
you know, the disadvantaged communities and in the different languages, as um, Sashti mentioned, you know, there are, uh, there are so many, uh, diff you know, people not speaking English. So that's really has been a, a big impact. And I think the other piece um, that, that works into that uh, for composting or uh, collecting your scraps is the other part of the message was just stop wasting food, uh, reuse your leftovers, um, cooking out of, you know, out of the leftovers, you know, and so we have included uh, that as part of the general message. Um, you know, um, reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycle is the third one. It's the reduce and the reuse, you know, that we really try to focus on. And I do think that that reaches out in, into those communities. I mean, it just makes sense. But, you know, when, when you're in a situation where you are being extra careful with your budget, it's nice to, you know, hear that, well, everyone's doing that. So. I'm going to back in. Is that okay? Oh, but we have a lot of questions, so let's just, okay. uh, Danielle, we'll just, I'm going to just keep us moving here because we have limited time, but um, I'm going to ask one more question on cost because we have a lot of related questions around that, staffing and cost, and then, Sashti, I'll hand it back to you to ask, ask a question or two, uh, but um, can any of you talk about what the program costs were for food scrap drop-offs? Um, I know, Danielle, yours were just a few totes. But you know, you have the what were the supplies? Did you have any paid staff? John, you talked about it being all volunteer based. So I want folks to understand, like to even get started here at farmers markets, maybe it's not a big cost, maybe the cost, and Gary, you mentioned grants. So I'm gonna, John, I'm gonna start with you and then go to Gary and Danielle. So John, anything you can share about staffing the sites, program cost, equipment? Yeah, our our staffing is still all volunteer at the farmers market. You know, we have committee members, generally supplemented with uh, high school students, uh, youth groups, um, other you know other adult volunteers that, that come in periodically to you know to help out. So the staffing is the staffing is is all volunteer. There's no no cost to that. Really, the only cost to the town at this point here now is you know getting somebody somebody to take the totes to to the composting sites so uh, you know it, it's it's built you know it's built into into their uh uh to their budget as to you know how much how much of that is i'm not 100 percent sure but it's it's a minimal cost because you know it's something that you know uh the people that that are involved you know it's going to be they're driving. They're driving from point A to point B. They just take a minor detour to pick up the totes and take them along with them. So, yeah. So minor cost um, as a volunteer on the committee, you probably don't, not don't have, can't share the detail. Gary, anything you can share on? Well, you know the grant. Um, the grants that we've gotten do cover uh, the you know the the cost of the totes, for instance, that we're going mm -hmm. to be. Uh, sharing with the municipalities for this upcoming grant, and obviously it covered the cost of building the site. Um, and then, uh, as a, you know, as the county, uh, a lot of our match becomes in kind. So it is, you know, the um, the worker at the at the correctional facility that's putting time in. You know, we do use that, you know, as match. And then even the inmates, that was all part of our. Um, figuring things out, you know, that they they do get paid, not very much, but they do get paid a little bit for doing this work. So that's all figured into that. Um, we we are able to offer this service uh, in this upcoming grant because we can take it to the correctional facility. So we know we're lucky in terms of, of being able to say to the municipality, it's not going to cost you any more than the transport, which I'm not saying is insignificant, but... Um, so uh, again, as as John pointed out, it, it's that you know sending somebody to do that work. So it's not they're not having to put out the cash, you know, for this. So so we are lucky that we can do that. And and Danielle, there was a specific question for you to answer related to this overall question was it? And the question is, was MAP compensated for its efforts in running the program? So we were not, and. Um... 
while there were many benefits, um, one of the things that happened over time, you know, all of our staff time was in kind, that was really our only cost, um, is that the demand for education and related activities grew significantly. And as a small nonprofit, we were not able to keep up with that demand. So that is definitely something to look out for. Like everybody wanted to take a class on worm bins and whatever else, you know, there's so many things that we just couldn't provide. So Sashti, back to you. Yeah, these are a lot of questions and we have, we only have five minutes left. Um, so I will try to do a, a gen general one. Um, one of the questions here was, um, it was focused on Gary, but I think uh, people were interested, maybe, um, John, you could also answer, what happens to the finished compost? Um, how does it return back to the, the community uh, or does it go to local agriculture? Oh yeah, well, thank you. I should have mentioned that. Right now, uh, the, the finished compost that's generated at the commercial facility is being used at county facilities. Uh, the commercial facility also has a greenhouse, so some of it is used right there. Uh, but you know, here at the Rath Building, you know, for our gardens and things like that, and some of the other facilities, um, we're hoping eventually there'll be enough generated where it could go in, in for part, to the Parks Department as well. And John, in the Amherst, the the the, the gener, you know, the, the amount generated so far is, you know, just basically, you know, being used for town facilities as well. Uh, plans are once once it gets ramped up that we would be able to, you know, give out small small sample, um, you know, small amounts to the residents upon demand, but uh, we're not quite at that point yet. I do know when the city of Buffalo got started with natural upcycling. Um, and they were only charging $10 a tote for picking up. I don't know what, that was a few years ago, so I'm assuming that price may have gone up, but that in and of itself made it much more doable for the city to take this on because they didn't, you know, the contract was not daunting. You know, if we're gonna generate three totes, that's gonna be $30 a week, you know? So that, that I do believe natural upcycling enabled the program to be uh, a relative at a relatively low cost. I'll try to do one more quickly. Um, a couple of questions relating to individuals have started farmer market pirates, farmers, uh, farmer market pilot programs. Um, as they expand, interest in sort of unstaffed drop off sites. Uh, a couple of you have mentioned that. Any concerns with contamination? And if so, or what have you done about it? I, I know uh, the city's unmanned drop-off sites have have been remarkably clean. And one of the things they found that the neighbor, the neighbors, or the facility where these drop-off sites are really take on some of this responsibility, and they make sure. So they have they have not had a problem with that. Uh, Danielle, I don't know if you have a or insight there. I think in 2020, we dealt with quite a bit of contamination. We had a lot of like dog poop bags and neighborhood trash and stuff like that, but there there was always somebody on site willing to deal with it. Um, but as the program grew and our signage got better, um, it was significantly reduced. I don't really think that that's much of a problem anymore. That's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in an Amherst case, you know, even though uh, the highway department technically has somebody watching over it, it, you know, it's basically one of those that, hi, we're here. Okay, good to see you. And, and there hasn't really been a contamination problem that, that, that I'm aware of at, at that site. The, the, the next site that we're looking at will be, you know, won't be manned directly by town employees. It, it, it's near our senior center, but, you know, the, the issue, issue will be not, not really worried about contamination, but making sure that at least somebody somebody takes some ownership. That if you know if there's a huge drop off, that you know we're not overflowing the bins and things like that before the, you know before the schedule pickups. So um, you know that that's that's where we're at right now. Brenda, can we do one more? 
Um, I'm going to do one more, but first I just want to tell folks, because people are dropping off since we're close to the end here, is just to thank everybody for attending and all the speakers. And uh, there will be a survey that pops up automatically. It's optional. All questions are optional. And we do have a few questions on seeking some demographic data, just intended to help us assess how well we are doing in reaching diverse audiences. So we, I just wanna verbally tell everybody we will never share any personal identifying data. Again, all questions are optional, but uh, we hope that you'll participate in that survey. And then the last question I wanna ask, so this is kind of 30 seconds each on the answer, is tips for replication. What is your top tip? Um, you know, for other local governments and starting food scrap off, drop offs. John, you mentioned already champions and copycats. Mm -hmm. So I will end with you have something yep. to add, but Gary to you, then Danielle and then to John and Sashti, I want you to answer this too if you've got something you want to share. So, Gary. I think it's talking about the cost savings uh, in terms of garbage uh, that, that the municipality is going to experience. That, that you know, talk talk money and you'll you'll make people uh and that's particularly hard here in western new york because our landfill costs are very low um so but if we can show that you're pulling out you know potentially 30 percent of your weight and you know food is heavy so good tip danielle schools too sorry danielle i think our best tip was just developing a really solid relationship i think that trust piece was like key to us John, anything you want to add to what you already shared? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to echo, echo Danielle. Uh, tr you know, getting the getting the trust of somebody, you know, somebody that that you can work with that is key. Sashti, anything you want to share? I'm going to say if we can mandate composting. Um, I know yeah. we see that in New York City, New York State's trying to do it, California. If we could get that legislation, I think these pieces can fall into place faster. Um, also, if the grants can go not necessarily directly to municipalities, can they be also supported through third party organizations? Good nonprofits, great for profit companies can all work together collaboratively. Sounds good. Well, New York State Pollution Prevention Institute is one way that that's being done. Thank you for all those tips. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you all for your time for attending and all those 80 of you who stayed on to the end. Thank you too. So, um, have a good week. Happy spring. Happy Earth Day week, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.